Hi folks, this is Jason, hope you're okay. We're looking at Paul Williams, the Muslim apologist. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com and we're looking at Dawa Digital and their videos and seeing what uh, Paul Williams has to say uh, about uh, Christianity. This is going to be my favourite video of all of the videos that we've looked at. Uh, the historical Jesus is the Muslim Jesus. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, let's see what Paul has to say. Don't forget, my website is jasonburnspreacher.com. You can get me on uh, Twitter, you can get me on Facebook, and look at the work and the ministry that I do. And let, let's see what uh, what Paul has to say here. And um, don't forget, uh, go to, uh, just get it in context, go to Dawa Digital and uh, subscribe to them. You can also go to my website, Jason Burns uh, YouTube channel and uh, connect with me as well so without further ado this is the favorite video of all that I'm looking forward to looking at and I hope it's a blessing to you I, I've noticed uh, um, over the years having been a Christian for so long before I became a Muslim um, is Christian New Testament scholars and other scholars when they look at the Bible the kind of things they're actually have they discovered they're actually saying about the Bible now these are top scholars they're not uh, priests normally these are people at Oxford and Cambridge and Yale and Harvard and, and Berlin and so on and these scholars have made some truly amazing discoveries uh, in the past hundred years or so about the Gospels uh, about the Bible itself about who Jesus probably was and as, as the real Jesus the historical Jesus and uh, I'll mention a few of these findings uh, now and there are many many of them and I really encourage you to look into this subject if you if you have a uh, you know, interest in it. Um, and then we'll talk about why it is so many Christians in the pews don't know anything about this, because that is, is an interesting subject in itself. So what are scholars, have? what are some of the things that scholars have discovered um, in the past hundred years or so? Now, well, he's going to talk about Western scholars and Western scholarship. Now, we're going to get into that, but before we do, I want to read a quote. It's a very important quote. I can find it. Sorry about this. But he's going to quote Christian scholars. And these many of these scholars are liberal. They don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible right and they are uh, they they come up the bible with various philosophical and social theories which we're going to get into in a minute islam has never had that kind of scholarship it's never had that kind of criticism in the book a short uh, fundamentalism a short introduction by malays ruthven 2007 we read this about islamic scholarship on the quran Higher critical scholarship of the Qur'an, using methodologies adopted from biblical criticism, is still large we can find to scholars working in Western universities. So sensitive is this area for Muslims that Ibn Warak, a Muslim-born writer trained in Arabic who accepts the findings of radical Western scholarship, has felt it necessary to publish his work under a pseudonym name. The Egyptian academic Nazar Abu Zayed who ventured to use modern literary critical methodology in his approach to the Qur'an, was forced into exile. Higher criticism of the Qur'an, where the text is deconstructed in accordance with methods developed by biblical scholars since the 18th century, is still very largely confined to scholars who are not Muslims. Examples include the work of John Waynesborough, Patricia Crone, and Gerald Horting, Western scholars of Islam who do not accept the traditional view of its origins as related in the earliest text. So they're saying that scholars who were critical of Islam are very few and far between because they're silenced and they have to use names that are not their names. So here Paul Williams is now going to go into Western scholarship and quote Western scholars, liberal scholars who criticize Christianity in the Bible. He's going to use a lot of them and yet Islam doesn't have anything like that because it's been squashed so it's a bit hypocritical him saying oh Christians and, the, and you need to go listen to these liberal scholars 
but Islam would not want you to listen to scholars that are criti criticizing Islam. In fact, they'll try to silence them, and these scholars have to go and use false names to hide their identity so that they're not attacked or so that they don't lose their jobs. One of the things is, and there's broad agreement on this, is that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are not written by eyewitnesses. And this is amazing. How can they not be written by eyewitnesses? They're called the Gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, Luke and John. And there are many reasons why scholars no longer think they're written by apostles, uh, actual disciples of Jesus. And I'll give you some of the reasons now, if you're interested. Well, one is they don't claim to be eyewitness testimony. They don't say, I, Matthew, or I, Mark, saw, so on. They're written in the third person. So in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the person writes about uh, Jesus, but not as a participant in the story, but as someone who um, is telling a story about other people in another time. And also they're written in Greek, and they're written uh, in very sophisticated Greek. But the people... So he's, you know, he had the book Bart Ehrman there, and he's given the impression that scholars don't believe there's eyewitnesses. Now he 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 um, if you if you look here on that video, it showed you the picture of um, Bart Ehrman, and he's Bart Ehrman is a very extreme. Critic of critic of Christianity, uh, and so that's the book, and that's the ideas that he's get, get, getting from. And he's saying that you know the gospels are not based on eyewitnesses, and he's saying scholarship has found this out. Uh, scholarship for about eighty years took that point of view that there weren't any eyewitnesses in the gospels, but because of this book and other books like it, scholarship's moved on. So Paul is not telling you the truth. This book has been a revolution in academic scholarship uh, where it's shown that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material. And, um, you know, you, there is what is called the technical term in, in Greek, the inclusio. And if you read the Gospel of Mark, you can see that it's based on the eyewitness of Peter because it has what is called an inclusio. It has an indication that it's using eyewitness material. Now you'll find that detail and scholarly information about Inclusio in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by uh, Richard Balcom, uh, published by W.B. Erdmans. So, so yeah, so the scholarship is there, scholarship is moving. Uh, there were hardly any scholars who believed the Gospels had eyewitness material. There are a growing number of scholars and it's more and more rapidly moving towards the idea that there is eyewitness material within the Gospels. And one of the reasons why uh, scholars for about 80 years believed there wasn't eyewitness is because of they had theories of community. And those theories of community were basically... Uh, the Gospels were not written in the first century, they were written in the second century and they were ri written by communities who had an agenda. But because we found more and more manuscripts in the last 80 years, that theory has crumbled because we can now date the New Testament in the first century quite comfortably and nobody's arguing about that or if anybody does argue, they're quite extreme in scholarship. So that's the first point. The second point is recently, the last eight years to ten years there's been research looking at the Gospels from the Greco and Jewish context and as we do that we're beginning to see that in the literary context of first century Judaism uh, the Gospels were written as uh, biography and as we look at the biographies of the time they were often tried to be rooted in eyewitness so these are the things that are happening in scholarship and Paul Williams is just not being honest with you about what's happening in the scholarly world. If you want to watch a resource, uh, if we go to uh, we go to um, some resource here uh, 
Let's see what Richard Balcom says. standard scholarly view of how the traditions about Jesus reach the evangelists when they were writing their Gospels is the view that formed criticism proposed early in the 20th century. And the view is that the eyewitnesses who heard Jesus speak, who saw the events of his life, presumably started the traditions off. But then there began a whole process of these traditions passing through the oral traditions of the, of the early Christian communities until eventually uh, they were tapped by the uh, evangelists. Um, and during that process, of course, anything could happen. And there have been different ways of reading it. Some people managed to read it in a fairly conservative way, as though the tradition preserved the traditions pretty well. Um, but the formal critics um, and the real disciples of the formal critics tend not to think that because they stress that the communities and the oral tradition were not really interested in history. So they have no real motive for preserving traditions about Jesus accurately. Their motives are much more to adapt and add to and kind of create freely uh, traditions about Jesus um, and add them to the traditions. So, and that's why on the form critical view you need, if you are going to say something about the historical Jesus, you need criteria to distinguish authentic material in the Gospels from inauthentic material. Um, and that's the way a whole lot of Gospel scholarship has gone. It's been very widely agreed now, I think, that the Gospels were biographies in the sense of ancient biography. Um, this has been debated, but that becoming the prevailing view, I think. Um, not in the sense of modern biographies, of course. We have to rule out all kinds of things that modern biographers do. Um, the kinds of things an ancient biographer did uh, are what are appropriate to the Gospels. But further than that, I think we have to see them as contemporary biographies, in the sense they were written while there were still eyewitnesses around. Um, and this is extremely important, because the way the ancients thought about history writing of history is that you could only write good history um, within living memory of the events um, and they distinguished real history in that sense. You know, real history has to be contemporary history um, and it's because they didn't have uh, all the kinds of archives and all the kinds of uh, sources and, and, and so forth uh, that modern historians had. What mattered for them is that they themselves either had been a participant in the events themselves, and that, of course, was the best thing of all, or alternatively, they'd, they'd actually been able to interview uh, eyewitnesses of the events. So the Gospels, I think, fit within that category um, that people would expect to be good history. They would expect it to be reliant on eyewitnesses. And they would, I think, be alert to indications in the Gospels of what the eyewitness sources of those Gospels were. The form critics um, regarded the Gospels as folk literature. Um, and this is why they were insistent on a long process of oral tradition. They were thinking of the kinds of traditional literature that's passed down orally in societies over the generations. Um, and that accounts for a lot of the way they thought about the Gospels. And it's partly why they denied that the Gospels are history or biography. They're folk literature. Um, but I think most scholars now think that was a mistake. Um, and if you compare the Gospels with uh, the literature of their time, uh, they turn out to resemble biographies, uh, best of all. Um, so I think we have to rethink that whole idea of what kind of thing the Gospels are. And if people would have expected them to be historical, if that's the kind of literary genre they would have identified um, when they first read or heard the Gospels, then I think we've got to apply uh, the kind of expectations uh, that ancient readers and hearers of historiographical literature uh, would have expected. We have these fragments of Papias' lost work, 
sadly lost work. It would have been extraordinarily interesting if we had it. But we have just these fragments, um, one of which uh, describes the way in which he himself collected gospel traditions um, for, his, for his own book. Um, and although he's writing in the early second century, we're not quite sure when, um, he must be describing what he was doing in around the 80s, um, around the time when the Gospels were being written. So it's very good evidence of how someone saw Gospel traditions around the time when the Gospels were written. And what Papias says is that he uh, learned traditions either from the elders who were teaching in, uh, in his area or people passing through and visiting. But what he would always ask them was, uh, have you any teaching from one of the apostles? Have you got something that Matthew said or something that uh, uh, John said? Um, and Papias, in other words, seemed to think of all traditions as attached to specific names, so they weren't anonymous. The passage has often been read as meaning that Papias preferred oral tradition uh, to written texts. And this, I think, has been a very influential misunderstanding. Um, what Papias prefers is stuff that's straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. Um, stuff from the apostles who were still living or who'd recently died. And oral tradition for him is more valuable because it comes from... We'll listen to uh, some more of that in a minute. So, so there's one top scholar and there are a number of scholars that have... Um, Just uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, there's other scholars there which we could look at, but uh, there are a number of scholars that actually have come round to the idea that there's eyewitness material. So Paul is just not being honest with you about the current scholarship. People that the the apostles were mostly peasants. Their socio-economic status, they were peasants basically, they were fishermen. They weren't literate, uh, they were untutored and illiterate people. They, they didn't know how to write their own language, let alone another language like Greek. So this is an argument that uh, he's not pumping this out from general scholarship, he's pumping this out from Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman makes this argument, general scholarship doesn't make this argument, okay? Uh, Bart Ehrman makes this argument about their peasants, their cultural peasants, and they weren't literate. That's Bart Ehrman. It's not ge the consensus of general scholarship. So, we'll let him make his argument, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, and there are many other reasons as well, which I won't go into, but they're not usually seen as by eyewitnesses at all, by, uh, by Christian and other New Testament scholars today. Um, another... Well, so we've debunked that. We, I've shown you that that's not true. Uh, so he talks about the... So the argument here, what he's, he's not fleshed it out, unless he fleshes it out in a minute. Basically, he's saying that... Bart Ehrman is saying, look, they, these uh, people were, were illiterate, so they couldn't have written the Gospels. Matthew... Matthew uh, was a tax collector. He would have most definitely had literary skills, writing... Uh, notes and information about collecting taxes so you know he would have been able to write uh, Luke was a, a physician he would have been educated able to write um, now the others uh, John who was a fisherman and Mark who was a, a, a helper in mission uh, these fishermen um, in the round the Sea of Galilee were quite wealthy and to the point where John is recognized uh, by that by the uh, temple uh, by officials of the temple so you know it shows you that the fishermen were not as uneducated or without resources if you if you're known by the temple people at the temple then you've got you, you've got some influence somewhere so you've got to be careful when you make these kind of historical arguments. You know, the fishermen around Galilee were were quite quite wealthy. They they did quite well. The fish there was spread throughout the ancient world. You could even get fish in Rome from Galilee. All right. So it was quite a uh, a productive area. 
and so they, they wouldn't have been as ignorant and as stupid as Paul's making out to be. So they could have written Gospels without any problem. When you go into the, uh, li you know, the, the other thing as well is, is Judaism had a long line of uh, priestly a priestly class that, that taught and trained its people. Jesus was connected to the priestly class. His cousin was John the Baptist, who was part, whose father was uh, a high priest, a priest in the uh, who, who did uh, temp, who had done temple duty. Now the priestly class were w well educated and trained in literary activity. So there was obviously within the Lord Jesus circle the access to literary training, and he even when he's in the synagogue, he. Uh, reads uh, the the Torah in the synagogue so he had literary skills so he spent time with the disciples for three years he could have trained the disciples the disciples were were not as poor and as ignorant as they made out to be they had potential to write Gospels uh, so I think that's enough to debunk uh, Bart Ehrman here and actually if you do some research in in uh, literary education in the ancient world uh, you find a lot of facts, like for example, there were libraries dotted about the ancient world, uh, public libraries that people could use uh, and to be educated. Uh, there were also uh, people who were private emanuenses who went and taught people. There was also um, um, slaves who were from other foreign lands that were very educated a lot of these people became Christian so they had uh, education uh, a lot of rich people actually were converted to Christianity if you read some of the early church fathers like Justin Martyr mentions this etc uh, you even get it in the gospel uh, in the book of James where James says you know the rich people to behave themselves so there was a lot of opportunity a lot of resources there that could have helped to write gospels so this uh, idea that Bart Ehrman has spouted that they were ignorant is pushing it far, far, far too, too much. And Paul Williams is taking it on board uncritically. The thing is that they, they have discovered that there is a, a degree of literary dependency. So in fact, you can see that one gospel is copying from another. If you look deep into the detail, you can see that, in fact, Matthew and Luke is copying from Mark. There is interdependency dependency but there's independency as well even by Ehrman has said that there are independent sources independent material within each of the gospels so it's a mute point and you can see how the later gospel writers have changed and edited uh, the words of Jesus of the words of the apostles and also given a different interpretation of the events that the earlier gospels narrate uh, and that has told us a lot about so he's using Bart Ehrman here again. He's not using like the main scholars. We would say that the, the four Gospels are like four cameras giving you different aspects of Jesus. That's why there are the differences. He's coming at it with a theory of community and, and, and that these have been edited and, and dotted. It's not coming from the evidence. It's coming from a theory of community. In fact, a book that you should read uh, that debunks these kind of theories, the Bauer... The Bauer um, Herman theory of community, which is behind these arguments that Paul Williams is making. Uh, the Heresy of Orthodoxy by Michael J. Kruger is a book to read and it will help you to debunk uh, Bart Ehrman and his ideas and, and what Paul Williams is saying. All right? It's by uh, Apollos. All right? Apollos. About the, the purposes and the intentions of the Gospel writers. Um, I, I, I'll give you, um, I, I mentioned examples before, i just give you uh, s s some uh, more examples as well. In, in Mark's Gospel, the earliest Gospel, uh, if you read it, Jesus doesn't really preach about himself. He preaches about something he calls the Kingdom of God. And this is God's reign, God's action in the world, bringing, bringing his purposes uh, to bear fruition in the world. And Jesus is uh, like a prophet, he's like a messiah. He, he calls himself the son of man. It's a mysterious phrase. But when we... It's a mysterious phrase that one of the references to the son of man is in Daniel, where it talks about the son of man comes as the ancient of days. The ancient of days is used as a, as a title for God. So the son of man comes, which implies 
there is a divinity within the Son of Man in Daniel. So, so Paul Williams knows this, but he doesn't want to tell you. When we fast forward to John's Gospel, the last Gospel to be written, we see a very different Jesus. There, the message of Jesus is about himself. It's about his relationship with his Father, the Son and the Father. Jesus says things and does things you just don't see in the earliest Gospels. He's Even in uh, Paul's uh, main arguments that he often uses about Mark chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10 he says to the rich young ruler, follow me. So this debunks what Paul's saying about Jesus wasn't talking about himself. He talked about the Father, but he also said, follow me. That's in Mark. Now in John, John is like, if you imagine th four cameras, the three cameras in Matthew, Mark and Luke are like looking at Jesus from a distance. The camera's looking at a distance. But now the camera comes right in into the close-up. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. It's like a real close-up to the inner workings, the inner heart of Jesus. And that's why there are differences, because it's more intense and close-up and intimate in, in its understanding of who Jesus is. And it's trying to give us a, a, a bird's-eye view, four Gospels, a bird's-eye view, a rounded view of who Jesus is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection of the life. He comes out with these amazing I am statements, which are unique to that gospel. No other gospel has Jesus says these, say these things. So scholars have had to choose. When Scholars are looking at our historians, and they're trying to work out what the historical Jesus, the real Jesus of 2,000 years ago, actually said and did. What was he about? Who was he? And they've had to choose between the earliest gospel, which presents a, a human Jesus, uh, who, who said and spoke and taught in a certain way and a much much later gospel which has Jesus say some amazing exalted things about himself and 99% of scholars have uh, over the last hundred years have decided the earliest gospels are more historically reliable they give us a truer picture of who Jesus was now I'll be intellectually honest there, there is a truth to what Paul's saying about the Gospel of John as opposed to the Synoptics. The scholarship has said uh, the Synoptics, particularly Mark, is more historical than uh, the Gospel of John. But it's not done on any evidence, it's done on a theological basis because there's so much theology within uh, the Gospel of John. The, the argument has gone, it's laden with theology, there's very little historical material, and therefore it's not historical. That's been the argument. But it's not, it's not been done on any uh, fair ideological or methodological critical analysis. And so this is the point about liberal scholarship. Liberal scholarship has come at it with a certain bias. And that scholarship has dominated for 80 years. There is solid historical material within the Gospel of John. There are at least... 40 historical facts within the Gospel of John. There is actually in Luke an element where Jesus says, you know, only the Son knows the Father. So there is a glimpse that the theology and the, the glimpse of who Jesus is in the Gospel of, Luke, uh, Gospel of John is the, is the Jesus of the Synoptics. Because it's married in Luke with that only... The Father knows the Son, which is basically what John is saying in its totality. Um, but again, the Gospel of John, um, the reason why scholars are not able to access it really is, is because they are theory laden with ideology. And if they just stripped that away and went to the text itself and looked at the text without their bias and without their philosophical glasses then they would find a lot of historical material in there uh, but it's because of their ideology they're not able to access the historical information uh, Craig Blomberg who's an evangelical scholar has written a book on the authentic historical veracity of the Gospel of John which uh, I would encourage you to, to read in fact if we go to that, maybe we could find uh, 
We could go to that. Let's see if we can get a clip of Craig. Craig. But again, I mean, I I don't disagree with Paul there. I mean, he's he's being he's writing what he's saying there. And then I I've done some videos on this, um, so you probably find some videos. So let's go. Sorry, Craig. of John historical so let's see if we can find anything on that yeah he's, there's a number of lectures there the historical reliability of the gospels historical reliability of the gospels uh, see if we can Just seeing if I can uh... well, this guy's giving a review of the book, so we'll see what he says. So you can get this book and this book will answer some of the questions about the Gospel of John. Craig Lombard, uh, the historical reliability of the gospels. Now he's an author. He's considered to be very big on biblical inerrancy. Now, um, by the way, I'm Steve Walter, pastor of New Life Pentecostal Church, Albany, Georgia. He's a little too new evangelical for my blood. Really the thing they're doing now in much of evangelical apologetics is they basically give away every point to the liberalists and the modernist scholars, and then say, we can still prove our point. Now, this is not the first generation that's tried that, because you give away the farm and say, well, we still believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or we can still prove the deity of Jesus Christ, or we can still prove certain things out of the Gospels. Well, to you've destroyed church because they know then they can't believe every word of the book. There's only certain concepts or historical facts that they can believe. So I like Blomberg. I believe he got his PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He now teaches at Denver Seminary. Cornucopia of information. That's the reason I would recommend a book like this. Not necessarily to believe everything in it. Of course, pray before you read any book and say, God, give me your truth out of this book. Let me hate every lying and wicked way. That is a scriptural thing. And so, Craig Blomberg, you can also, in books like this, in his bibliography, that's the real treasure trope because you can begin to see other places that would have historical reliability uh, admonitions and encouragements in there as well. So Blomberg, of course, he's going to say that overall that you can believe the Gospels, that you can do this. He's very big in evangelical apologetics right now, writes a lot on gender issues and things. But he's again, he's going to give away the farm a little bit in doing so. So this is by IVP Academic InterVarsity Press. You can also tell a lot by who publishes the book. And IVP is kind of new evangelical now. They're not staying. They wouldn't be what's known as fundamentalist. And all the negative baggage that the term fundamentalism carries with it. But I will tell you, all it means is you believe the fundamentals of the faith. It started with the fundamentals by uh, R.A. Torrey back in 1914, and it was sent out to like 800,000 ministers. So, uh, it's not a bad thing to be a fundamentalist. It means you believe in absolute truth. Those that don't believe in absolute truth, then the absolute truth of that statement must be incorrect, and it must so there must be absolute truth. So it's kind of a self-refuting argumentation. Interesting book. This is the second edition. 
I would encourage you, if you're interested in these type studies, get this book. God bless you. Amen. I would agree with that gentleman. Uh, you got to read uh, Craig Blomberg critically. He does give away a bit to modern scholarship. Uh, but there'll be enough information there to show you that the Gospel of John does have accurate historical information and can be trusted as a source. Now we'll just finish off with this gentleman here. Richard These Barker. living sources, um, not because it's all rather than written. This group of disciples whom Jesus set aside as in some way having a special role, the twelve, um, and doubtless he thought of them as the uh, leaders of the new Israel representing the twelve tribes. But one special thing about the twelve is that uh, they were all disciples who had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, probably from when he was baptised by John, um, right through to his death, and they were witnesses of, it, of resurrection appearances. Um, and this seems to have been the, uh, the criterion um, of a full witness to the life of Jesus. The people who remembered this or that event, this or that saying, of course were doing something significant for the early church, but they also wanted uh, figures who had been around over the whole course of the events and could give, as it were, a sense of the whole story. The Twelve were the obvious people to do this, and they were also the authorities of the church in Jerusalem, the mother church of the Christian movement. Um, so I think it's very likely that the Twelve Apostles would have been the first people to promulgate kind of official versions of the tradition. They would, at some stage in the early history of the Jerusalem Church, I think, um, collected traditions, sorted out their own traditions in, into some kind of official form. And I think that's also reflected in the way that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke uh, give a very careful and detailed list of, of, of the Twelve. Most of the Twelve, of course, don't appear individually in the Gospel narratives, so we wouldn't have heard of most of them were they not for this list. Um, and I think uh, the Gospel writers are saying, in a sense, um, these are the credentials of the witnesses from whom the overall bulk of the, the traditional material uh, we're writing has come from. There's an interesting phenomenon in the Gospels which people have not paid much attention to, which is about the names given to characters in the Gospels. Um, people in the Gospels who play important roles, like the, the Twelve Apostles and, and Mary Magdalene and so forth, are of course named, and that's what we would expect. But if you turn to the minor characters in the Gospels, uh, people who perhaps just crop up in one story, they meet Jesus on one occasion, uh, they are healed by Jesus on one occasion. Most of these characters in the Gospels are anonymous. And again, that's what we might well expect. Um, but what doesn't fit that pattern is that num a number of these minor characters do in fact have names. Um, and it's worth just thinking about why should that be? Why should just a few of these characters be named by the evangelists when standard practice was obviously that they're left anonymous and presumably... Uh, the evangelists didn't know the names of, of the various people who were healed by Jesus, for example. And I think the, the, the uh, explanation of this, which uh, uh, holds most um, plausibility, I think, is that these people, such as Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, or Jairus, the father of the girl who was raised from the dead, these people became members of the early Christian communities, um, and they themselves told these stories, their own stories, um, what had really uh, changed their lives, high, highly um, significant events for them, their encounters with Jesus. And they told these stories uh, quite naturally, um, but more and more, of course, they would be asked to tell their story. Um, and so at, when these stories passed on to other churches or to the writers of the Gospels, they would have these names attached to them. So that these particular cases, Bartimaeus, for example, uh, this is how Bartimaeus told his own story, um, and that was passed down to others. Sorry about that, I was trying to get a book from the windowsill, <laughs> if you can see there. I don't know if you can see. But I've just dropped a lot of books there, so um, 
Yeah, you can see my video there, the historical reliability of the Gospel of John there. Let's see what N.T. Wright says. I don't agree with everything N.T. Wright says, but let's listen to it. He's the Gospel of John has been uh, a difficult subject for historians to handle for these last couple of hundred years, because there's been an assumption out there that Matthew, Mark and Luke are kind of the historical bit and John is the theological bit. Now, just as we now know that Matthew, Mark and Luke are every bit as much theological, I think it's time to start looking at John and saying, maybe there's more history there than met the eye. Now, in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a movement of British Johannine scholarship, which was saying there is a lot more history in John than we'd supposed. But I don't think that movement really went far enough. What I think I've shown in my works, which are based on Matthew, Mark and Luke particularly, is that actually the Jesus of history, reconstructed from Matthew, Mark, did believe that Israel's God was present and active in himself, did believe that he really was Israel's Messiah. Because, you see, when we read in John, Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world, I'm the bread of life, I'm this, I'm that. Just to say, I don't agree with everything N.T. Wright says, but N.T. Wright is one of the biggest New Testament historical Jesus scholars in the world today. So, he's saying that we need to look at John in a more historical way. Alright, so, I agree with Paul Williams, what he said, that, and, and N.T. Rice just said it, that scholarship has generally seen the Gospel of John as not historical. But like N.T. Rice saying, uh, there were certain theories of why scholars thought that way, and that we need to change those theories, uh, and, and actually come and look at the evidence afresh, and that's what N.T. Rice saying. We have short-circuited the meaning of those phrases. We have thought that they meant, without remainder, I am the second person of the Trinity. But actually, I think if you had been present with, say, Simon Bar at the last stages of the Jewish War in 70 AD, if you'd been present with Bar Kokhba in 132 to 135, I think he'd have said, I'm the light, follow me and you won't walk in darkness anymore. I'll give you the bread of life, you come to me, you'll never be hungry again. This is Jewish messianic language. I don't think it means I am some supernatural being. You know, I think we've misread John like that. Now, I haven't done all the work. Now, I would disagree with him there. I would totally disagree. But what he's saying is, this language of I am the vine, I am the bread, that there is there, there is a possibility of looking at it in its historical context and seeing it as historical. Okay? Uh, but I would disagree the way about is going about it, but, you know, it just shows you that to say that the Gospel of John is not historical, um, it, there, there are possibilities of seeing that there is a historical information that we can use there. To follow this through, but one other insight which I've struggled with sometimes, but I think is true, what we have in Matthew, Mark and Luke comes out quite neat in chunks of about 10 or 14 or 15 verses, usually, some slightly longer. That's why it's so easy to find bits to read out in church. If you want a nice little chunk, it'll come away clean. And there's another bit, and there's another bit, with little connections between very hard to do that with lots of John. Some of those discourses in John seem to go rambling round and round and round like this. I once saw a world-class actor do a performance of John's Gospel from memory, and he said at the beginning, he said, sooner or later in this performance, I'm going to forget where I am. He said, I've got a little copy here, and I will look at it. Sure enough, halfway through chapter 8, he just got a little bit lost, just checked it out, carried on, didn't happen again. And that's because I think John's Gospel is, has not been shaped by the church telling the story so often that it fell into an anecdote form, a nice easy thing, and this bit, so that it just made sense like that. I think John's Gospel grows out of the memory of an Anne who has been praying over this stuff again and again and again. I can't prove that, but it makes quite a lot of sense to me. And within that, of course, his life of prayer and preaching and devotion and holiness has coloured the way he says it. But I think John's Gospel goes back, as John A.T. Robinson said, to source rather than to sources. And that when we look at that source, it really does turn out to be Jesus, as, as whoever wrote John chapter 21 says. So, I don't agree with a lot of what he was saying there, but what, what, what N.T. Wright is saying there, 
is that as modern scholarship has not looked at the Gospel of John as historical, that it's time to reconsider that for many, many reasons that he gives. Uh, Blombler gives other reasons, N.T. Wright gives other reasons, but it's showing you that when Paul Williams saying that scholarship has completely discounted the Gospel of John as historical, that there are scholars now beginning to question that. And John, for example, gives a highly interpreted account. It's almost as if John believes that Jesus is the light of the world, so he puts these words in Jesus' mouth. And this language of putting words in someone's mouth is the language that scholars use. This is not my invention. They say, well, John puts these words in Jesus' mouth. So they're not historical. They're what historians call secondary. So they're not the real Jesus. So Again, I would say a lot of scholars, even people like N.T. Wright, and even people like Blomblog, who are, who are people who will be more uh, to the right than to the left of, of scholarship, even they are tainted by theories. A lot of these things come with theories of community. I keep saying this. If you believe that the Bible's not inspired and you believe that there was only uh, there were a variety of Christianities, then you're going to believe that later on communities just made things up and put things in. But if you believe that Christianity is true and you believe there was only one Christianity, then you're going to believe that there were eyewitnesses and they told you what was there. And it's because of your theory that you come to the conclusions that you come to. If you come that the that the the gospels were written by eyewitnesses, then you will find that they make perfect sense. They're looking them from their perspective. If you come in a theory of community that there was no such thing as one Christianity but a variety of Christianities and therefore communities made this up, then you're gonna come that things were added and that are not original and historical. But the point is when we do historical analysis, when we look at the historical times we find that the Gospels fit into that framework and into that time. And that's where we, where the scholarship is required and that is where the Gospel of John should not be rejected as, 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 as not historical information. It is historical information and can be verified as such in, in um, looking at the, the uh, various uh, archaeological and uh, other literary texts of that time. What is the real, who is the real Jesus according to most New Testament scholars? Well, he was a prophet. Historically, Jesus was a prophet of God. I would agree with that. Also, they believe yeah. that he was... I would agree that this is what scholars say. He believed in... E.P. Sanders, for example. Himself ...to be a Messiah, an anointed by God. And that, and an eschatological prophet as well. So someone who taught, uh, like the Old Testament prophets, to repent, return to God, but also about the end times. Eschatology means to do with the end, the end of the world. So Jesus was preaching about the end of the end times, uh, and he was calling people back to a renewed and purified Judaism. Now, does that strike Muslims as vaguely familiar? What does the Quran say about Jesus? It says that he was a prophet. It says that he was... But a lot of the scholarship that has come to that conclusion is well, reductionistic, and that is to say, it, it is reductionistic. You know, um, that is to say, anti supernatural. Uh, so, because they're reductionistic and anti supernatural, they just focus on various bits of the text that suit them. Uh, like I said, I. Uh, there is a lot of scholars now that have come to the conclusion uh, that the Gospels are more historical, generally speaking. Uh, a lot of scholars are looking at it from a Jewish perspective. And also a lot of scholars are looking at it from early Christology, that they're seeing that the divinity of Christ was taught early on. So these things are not what Bart Ehrman's saying and other scholars. So to say that all scholars have come this way, like... Uh, Paul Williams is saying is not correct to, to the actual historical, uh, to, to, to what the academic world is saying. I've tried to be honest about what it, what, what Paul Williams said, and I've even given way a little bit to one of his comments, but I hope that... Um... So that's Paul Williams. Um, 
I've tried to do my best. I've tried to uh, give you, you know, scholarship in in uh, biblical scholarship is kind of my meat and drink. I I enjoy reading what scholars say. You know, I can learn more. We can all learn more. But I'm always trying to keep in touch with what scholars are saying and what scholars are thinking in these areas. And I've tried to give you a fair assessment of Paul Williams uh, in these videos. And um, so I, I encourage you to go and read, go and study. And when you're reading the Bible or even the Quran, make sure you read things in context. Make sure you be fair and honest to your opponents. And make sure you do the research. But I would say, my assessment of Paul Williams is that he knows quite a bit. He's quite educated in, in uh, biblical scholarship. But he's not intellectually honest and being fair to his opponents. He's not critiquing his opponents in a fair way. He's not bringing the, his opponents' arguments and then debunking them. He's coming up with his own pseudo-arguments and he's not looking at things in a fair way. And he's misrepresenting a lot of the time about 95% of the time when he talks about scholarship he's actually misrepresenting scholarship and he's misrepresenting it to you the public that's my assessment professional assessment as someone who's been involved in academic theology for over 10 years that is my professional assessment of Paul Williams Williams he's not being intellectually honest with you the public and letting you know what really is going on in the academic world out of all the points that he's made, he made one point that was actually true about the Gospel of John, and that was it. All right. Hope you enjoyed that, and thanks for listening. God bless you. I'll leave you with Paul Williams there, and uh, God bless you. Don't forget to go to uh, Digi uh, Dawa Digital and sign up with them. And don't forget to go to... my uh, YouTube channel Jason Burns so this is my uh, YouTube channel so don't forget to sign up with my me as well and uh, follow me as I'm street preaching and, and preaching and so, uh, this is uh, my uh, website, the uh, uh, YouTube channel, and uh, you can see me uh, preaching in Manchester and around the UK. Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready for that day? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Sorry for Let the shaky ca camera. You believe in so there we are. Uh, that's Paul Williams. My website's jasonburstpreacher.com. Uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, sign up and come and join me on my journey. So thanks for listening and God bless you.